Welcome. It's, it's wonderful to see so many of you here on, on such a decidedly un-garden-like uh, day. <laughs> Perhaps that will make it even more wonderful to hear uh, this, about this topic. We're very fortunate to have Susan Taylor LeDuc here to, um, to tell us about this current project that she's involved in. I understand this is the title of your um, book project that's, correct. that's in, in the works at the moment. Susan comes to us from Paris, um, where she has been academic director and associate professor in art history at Trinity College and been um, most recently dean at Parsons Paris. She has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, where she worked on Hubert Robert and the Bain d'Apollon at Versailles. Um, and uh, she has done lots of teaching um, for many different programs in Paris over the years, where you've lived for something like 20 years. Is that the case? I hate to say that it's actually more than 20 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Almost, well, almost okay. half my life. Okay, well, that has, <laughs> it's obviously bearing fruit, shall we <laughs> so say. So to say. Yeah. Um, she has also worked on uh, exhibitions at the uh, Musée Carnavalet at the New Orleans Museum of Art um, and various other places and contributed lots of articles to various collections. Um, most, well, recently, for example, um, an article in um, Cultivated Power, Flowers, Culture, and Politics in the Reign of Louis XIV. Um, We're okay. Pardon? You know, no, no, this is, this is important. We do this here. Delivered lots of papers. I'm just sort of looking through to, to pick out um, topics that are, are very close. And, um, oh, those were, those were papers. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, anyway, let, let's say this article, The Pleasures of Surprise, The Picturesque Garden in France, um, published in The Senses and Society in 2016. Market Gardens in France, a uh, circulus intelligent from 1790 to 1900 in Food in the City, published uh, by Dunbar and Oaks. That's, it says forthcoming. Has that come out? That's come out. That's come out. Great. Okay. Um, about lots of articles about trees. Um, so you, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, let's welcome Susan. Thank you. you. Thank you all very much, but thank you so much for coming out in this horrible weather. Um, I hope that there's enough um, inspiration by both Marie Antoinette and Josephine, but also a little bit of green space to make the street in the future. Um, I'm with this closer a little bit. Can you hear Susan? Can you hear? Not really. No. Okay. no. Maybe get put this closer. Closer to me. Okay. Better. better. Is that better? Okay. So. Um, still not enough, sorry. Still not enough. Better? Not really. Not really. Is this better? <laughs> better. Better. There we go. Okay. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for coming in this um, horrible weather. And let's, uh, there, I understand there are some students here. I always love um, working with students and particularly helping them with either Marie Antoinette or Josephine. So I'm more than happy to spend some time if, you, if you're not running off to class afterwards um, to speak with you. So. Marie Antoinette's unpredictable trajectory from pampered princess to the guillotine and the lesser known but equally fascinating account of Josephine's rise from daughter of a Caribbean planter to a divorced empress are captivating life stories. Since the bicentenary of the French Revolution, scholars have reconsidered their historic roles, yet their biographies continue to inspire blockbuster films, TV series, and social media channels that continually highlight their status as our first modern celebrities. For example, Marie Antoinette moments serve as memes to assert cultural incomprehension when, for example, Melania Trump wore stiletto heels on a trip to a devastated flood zone. Similarly, Josephine emerges as a model for Brigitte Macron's dedication to her younger, most ambitious husband. The fact that both these historical figures seem to be pre precursors for what we recognize today as political wives deserves further consideration, 
Is it possible that female self-fashioning, a viable sign of empowerment at the beginning of the modern period, has contributed to casting both queen and empress as trend-setting interlopers rather than as politically engaged patrons? Today, I would like to re-examine how we historically frame, conceive, and perpetuate female agency by focusing on Marie Antoinette's and Josephine's decisions to become garden patrons, the garden, metaphorically a site of eternal fertility and sensual delight, is traditionally gendered female. Yet, given the place of the garden in the social and political economy of the early modern period, for women, garden patronage also provided an opportunity to experiment with statecraft. I argue that despite the queen's regicide, Josephine turned to the Petit Trianon as a paradigm for her own patronage because the queen's gardens were a living legacy of female empowerment. As patron and designer at the Petit Trianon, Marie Antoinette cast herself as a modern mother and steward, promoting both silvicultural and horticultural diversity while symbolically managing her domain. Josephine adapted and significantly expanded upon the Queen's legacy in order to legitimize her changing status from consulless to empress and ultimately to divorcée. So I just need to do that little switch. Josephine's biography provides the narrative structure for my talk, yet I focus on three interrelated themes in order to best highlight how Josephine emulated Marie Antoinette. An overarching theme addresses the tenacity of the garden as an allegory of fecundity, when both women were destined to provide male heirs. Although mothers, both women suffered from court gossip, slander, and international consternation about their fertility. So I'm showing you a portrait of Marie Antoinette from 1787, and you should keep in mind that she had four children, including two male heirs, and a portrait of Josephine from 1808, 1809, um, where you can see her kind of looking at the bust of her son Eugene, and the uh, flowers on the table is a bunch of Hortensia, and her daughter's name was Hortense. A second theme focused on a topic that was central to picturesque aesthetics, the acclimatization of new species to the indigenous landscape. Acclimatization, how plants, animals, and humans adapt to different climates, was a subject that animated debates about pharmacology, colonization, and zoology, both prior to this period and well into the 19th century. But the debates had a particular resonance for both women who were considered foreigners who had to acclimate to French court. A third theme considers the role that each woman played as both milkmaid and shepherdess, roles that seem to endorse the perception of their patronage as expressions of luxurious frivolity, but when considered as part of the larger debate about acclimatization, had ramifications for estate management and the development of picturesque garden theory and practices. So now we have some sunshine. Nonetheless, both the Petit Trianon and Mount Maison survived as living legacies now considered examples of each patron's exceptional taste. The beauty of the gardens has ironically obscured the very complex issues of sovereignty and agency that informed their creation. This reassessment of the role of the Austrian queen and Creole empress's patronage therefore offers, offers an alternative reading of the French picturesque garden movement. Whoops. Josephine's lived experience, support, and dependence on the Caribbean sugar trade has often been suppressed in studies of Malmaison. Although nostalgia for the lush landscape may have motivated her desire to acclimate exotic plants, recent biographical studies have revealed Josephine's continual reliance on her knowledge of the plantation economy, as well as her construction of a dedicated network of bankers and speculators who all benefiting from the sugar trade enabled Josephine's social ascension. When Josephine was born in 1763, Martinique had over 80,000 slaves and 274 sugar plantations. So I'm showing you a, side, a slide on the left, on my left, of Fort, uh, Port Royal in around 1750 and plantations, but actually from Jamaica on the right. Thanks to her mother's inheritance, her father descended from an impoverished noble family um, became a member of the plantocracy on his wife's sugar plantation that included over 500 hectares. 
Unlike her future peers in Paris, Parisian salons who read travel literature about ex escapes to exotic islands, Josephine understood the island economy and cash crops. Sugar, tobacco, cafe, and cotton were not luxurious delicacies, but commodities whose value was worth more than human lives. After 10 years on the family plantation in 1772, Josephine, then known as Marie Rose, was sent to convent school at Fort Royal. Four years later, she attained a rudimentary education, reading, writing, and basic math, but also some of the social graces she would later deploy, in particular, her ability to dance and to move her body with an elegance that was noted by all who met her, postures she perfected over the next 20 years until they were considered expressions of her exotic, and you can also say Creole, charm. By 15, Josephine was expected to circulate in the colonial society of Martinique, and one year later was engaged to be married to the royal governor's son, Alexandre de Beauharnais, providing her family with unexpected revenue. I rehearsed Josephine's early years because Josephine's heritage created a bond with the young Napoleon Bonaparte. As Christophe Ponsmay succinctly summarized, both Josephine and Napoleon shared a mutual history as descendants of impoverished noble families with modest means, who grew up on islands, a youth that influenced their desire to own property, a visible sign of their social and financial success under the Ancien Regime. When Josephine left Martinique in 1779 to be married in Paris, Marie Antoinette's reign was at its popular apogee. The queen received the Petit Trianon as a gift from Louis XVI in 1774, and she exploited it as a substitute for motherhood. If her marriage was unconsummated, she symbolically fertilized her gardens at Versailles. At the Petit Trianon, she was an active designer. Working with her architect Richard Meek, supported by the botaniste florist Claude Richard and his son Antoine, she created a new domain on the frontiers of public and private spaces where the garden served as inspiration, backdrop, and motivation for her agency. So I'm using as a primary document here Claude-Louis Châtelet, who lived from 1753 to 1795. He made a series over three separate series of diplomatic gifts, which were um, watercolor illustrations that were bound together in what we call a recueil, you know, series. Um, and they are some of our best document documentation for the Petit Trianon. So you should also know, perhaps, that Claude-Louis Châtelet sat on Marie Antoinette's judgment panel during the Revolution and condemned her to death. Um, but he himself was guillotined a year later. Um, from the, just, just you should know, um, from the pavilion, the queen and her entourage strolled along a curving circuit walk where they encountered the archetypes of picturesque decoration, a rocher, so that's the massive rocks. Let me see if I can do this properly. Um, red. Right? Whoops. So here's, whoops, here's the rocher. Now this never was actually realized this way. This is fanciful. It was a wooden bridge. Um, so they, stro they strolled from the rocher across a rusticated bridge um, that crossed over a water cascade to a Belvedere pavilion, a grotto, and a temple of love. Uh, Jacques-Ange uh, Gabriel's pre-existing pavilion, um, the Petit Trianon, was integrated into the landscape as an architecture of fabrique or folie, and we can also see what was called a Chinese merry-go-round and gallery on the right. Um, I'm not sure that you can see it very well, but there were kind of Chinese men mounted on um, uh, peacocks who would turn around here, um, and there was a guy actually underground who was pushing to make sure that everybody could uh, turn around on the merry-go-round. Um, kind of like a, a, a mill. It was like a mill, but underneath. Um, we can also see this Chinese merry-go-round displaying the latest fashion for chinoiserie. While Marie Antoinette famously uprooted Bernard Jussieu's botanical garden at the Trinon, the trees and the plants were sent to the Jardin du Roi, yet she continued to promote acclimatization. Um, she claimed trees from royal nurseries, planting species from Canada and North America, highlighting royal ambitions to increase trade with the former American colonies after 1783. Now, what I would note is there was a colonial network in transatlantic trade in trees that has been discussed um, 
quite in depth by Elizabeth Hyde and also by Meredith Martin in her discussion of Rambouillet, where um, the plants that were sent by an explorer whose name was Michaud and then sent back to plants to be acclimatized were part of a larger colonial network. I'm not going to talk about that in great detail, but if anybody has any questions about it, I'm happy to um, talk about it a little bit later. But I think the Queen was aware of it. She might not have been aware of the extent of um, what a colonial network really meant, but she certainly knew how to take advantage of it. Um, Marie Antoinette commissioned botanical illustrations of the plants that flourished at the Petit Trianon. Pierre-Joseph Boucault, an aspiring naturalist, published 260 engraving of plants from the Petit Trianon entitled The Garden of Eden, or The Terrestrial Paradise Reinvented in the Queen's Garden at the Trianon from 1783 to 85. As Gabriella Lamey has demonstrated, the scientific community did not warmly receive Boucault's work as he named plants according to his own nomenclature in order to honor his patrons. The queen was particularly interested in appreciating flowers, not only for their blossoms, but also for their scents. Lilies, hyacinths, anemones, narcissus, carnations, irises, roses, and violets were intensely cultivated. A Habsburg, Marie Antoinette's adaptation of floriculture, especially roses, referred to her family's heraldry. The intense planting of roses at the Petit Trianon implied that the Habsburg rose could bring an eternal spring to France. So I'm showing you on a le the left a map from 1660, 1677 that was actually dedicated to Prague, um, but it also shows you that right down here the rose um, grows out of Vienna. The intense planting of roses at the Petit Trianon implied that the Habsburg rose could bring an eternal spring to France. The Queen's protected image as a naturalized rose protecting the floriculture of France did not align with the competing perceptions that she was an Autrichien, separated from the King, privileging private pleasures in opposition to the concerns of state. Although Marie Antoinette may have thought that she was endorsing the prosperity of the realm, her imposition of restricted access to the site implied that for some critics, the Petit Trianon was a secretive retreat for select female courtiers where female authority suspended or upended male rule. When Josephine, while Josephine was not amongst those who were invited to the Queen's domain, we can imagine that the young Josephine was aware of reports about the Queen's gardens and guidebooks, such as Delors' description of Paris and its environs from 1786, and I quote this description. The gardens laid out in the English style reunite all the pleasures associated with the charming ingenuity of the composition. It is in this pretty place that our queen comes to relax from the ceremonial of court and prefers the happy irregularity of nature to the cold symmetry of the arts. We find beautiful waterways, an island in the middle with a round temple of love, that's what you're seeing on the right, the belvedere in the form of an, octo an octagon that dominates an irregular lake, charming bosquets, a merry-go-round, a hameau, and a grotto whose primitive, and the word is sauvage in French, character pro produces a surprising effect. There are also hills, cultivated areas, prairies, and groups of trees, a beautiful painting with nature that has all the grace of a beautiful disorder. It is important, end of quote. It is important to point out that Delors referenced the Queen's joining of both botanical and agronomic interests to the picturesque aesthetic, although her role as an estate manager was visualized and practiced at the Hameau. The Hameau, an ornamental farm, was constructed between 1783 and 1787. Its 11 buildings, whose rustic facades recalled vernacular Norman architecture, were scenographically arranged around an artificial lake. Kitchen gardens adjoined the buildings and were planted with artichokes and cabbages. Flower gardens enclosed by small box hedges were planted with many different flowers, but notably roses, hyacinths, and geraniums. To explain the productivity of the farm, which included two dairies, the queen planted fields of cereal crops, barley, oats, and buckwheat, to the north of the hamlet, as well as alfalfa, clover, and flax, so that the cows and sheep could graze and provide fresh milk products to the dairy. After her children were born, Marie Antoinette frequently retreated to the Hema with them in accordance with the popular educational precepts of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In so doing, however, she was underscoring her fecundity and capacity to perpetuate the Bourbon line. The Queen's investment, 
um, in the illusion that she could live the simple life in her garden domain with her friends, reclaimed the pastoral, which as Meredith Martin has demonstrated in her study, The Queen's Dairies, was a decision that appears as a tenuous choice to modern viewers, but was particularly well suited for monarchical imagery. The Queen's playing of Milkmaid and Shepherdess at the Hameau was intended as a royal endorsement of good estate management, maternity, and seniorial virtue. When Josephine resided in France from 1779 to 1788, how did she reconcile conflicting accounts of Marie Antoinette's garden patronage as manifestations either of a dedicated consort or disenfranchised luxurious trendsetter? While knowledge of court gossip and fashions would have been crucial to Josephine's ability to participate in social events, her biographers do not indicate that she was attuned to the politicalization of the Queen's patronage. Her education in Martinique was rudimentary. In these years, she dedicated herself to the art of listening, not necessarily conversation. As a vicomtesse under the Ancien Regime, Josephine would have recognized that Marie Antoinette transformed the Petit Trianon to a feminized modern domain. Notably, jo Josephine would have been aware that she endorsed colonial policies in her selection of plants, advocated garden, agrarian reform, and promoted floriculture, not only in her gardens, but also in the decorative arts, including porcelains and textiles, which is what I'm showing you here. If Josephine's rank prohibited her from visiting the gardens of the Petit Trianon under the Queen's tenure, we can imagine that Josephine was more disposed to visual culture, and again, without direct records of her visits to any of the salons from 1780 to 1788, her later portraits in her art collection suggest an early interest in paintings. She may have seen, but at the very least, would have heard or read about these two portraits of the Queen in her gardens. Uh, the one by Vigée Lebrun on the left, um, Marie Antoinette as the, as the rose, and the Wintermuller portrait of the Queen strolling with her children. Both paintings were celebrity portraits. These portraits equally revealed the Queen's forging of her independence, which as Mary Sheriff and Melissa Hyde have already demonstrated, may have encouraged, they've, dis, did, they've explained how fashionability was part of her um, independent character, the Queen's independent character which may have encouraged Josephine to consider her own possibilities of female agency. What remains striking about this period of Josephine's biography is her own self-fashioning as an independent woman. Forced to separate from her notoriously libertine husband, she retired to a convent for two years, which functioned as a safe house for noble women. And during her retreat, Josephine continued her apprenticeship into the world of Ancien Regime sociability. Perhaps inspired by her self-imposed sisterhood, Josephine hired a lawyer and won her case for a separation de corps and bien from Alexandre, a status that did not allow her to remarry during the ancient regime. Despite her legal victory and the award of child support, her payments were not forthcoming. After two years without financial means, she decided to return to Martinique, where the colonial economy was flourishing. Now age 25, Josephine bet that her chances of securing her fortune were better in the colonies than in Paris. The family networks Josephine had already established in Martinique were renewed during her stay from 1788 to 90 and remained the core of her personal patronage system. Similar to her Paris sojourn, Josephine appears insensitive to the political instability of Martinique. She fled the island precipitously during the slave revolts of 1790. Would Josephine return to this memory when she was Empress of France 12 years later? We will return to this question. At this point, it is important to point out that Josephine continued to define herself with her native Martinique, not only the luxurious Caribbean landscape, but her identity as a Creole and her access to international trade networks. When Josephine returned to Paris, the royal family was no longer at Versailles. Noble privileges had been abandoned one year earlier, and emigration was underway. Alexandre de Beauharnais had become an active political figure, yet the rapidly changing political climate in Paris led to Alexander's incarceration on March 2, 1794, which led to his death in the guillotine in July. As citoyenne de Beauharnais, Josephine found friends and financial support thanks to Alexander's reputation until she too was imprisoned in April 1794, until she was liberated from the prison de Carme in August, saved by the fall of Robespierre. 
Now a single mother of two, Josephine needed to assure her family's financial stability. So what I'm showing you on the right is a 19th century image of Josephine visiting Alexander with her two children, Hortense and Eugene. But on the left, you can see that it's inspired by the portrait of Marie Antoinette saying goodbye with her children to Louis XVI before he was sent to the guillotine. From 1794 until 1796, Josephine turned to her Creole networks and audaciously speculated with promises of funds from her mother in Martinique, either sugar or livre royal, to attain financial credit in Paris. Did Josephine question the source of her funds, profits from the slave trade and appeals to the entitlements attributed to a formal uh, vicomtesse? Was she aware of the political implications of the revolution of the Caribbean? It seems not. Josephine's pursuit of financial stability and luxury denied what we would identify as any ethical considerations today. Josephine's capacity to speculate became her modus operandi. She would particularly hone those skills focusing on the acquisitions of property, notably Malmaison. This is Malmaison a little bit later, but she would have seen it when she was um, in retreat in Kwasi in this period. Um, but she understood that property would enhance her social standing. In October 1795, Josephine undertook a serious gamble. She rented a house in the Chaussée d'Antin district. At the end of a tree-lined alley, and I, that's, you can see the plan of the, land, the real estate speculation in a, a copy of the house that she um, rented. At the end of the tree-lined alley, the house recalled the bagatelle, pavillon de chasse, and hermitage that characterized picturesque gardens that had flourished in the Paris of the 1780s. From her house on the Rue Chantrain, Josephine emerged as one of the merveilleuses of the directory. Josephine's career as a merveilleuse has been well documented and is beyond the scope of this paper today. Suffice it to say, Josephine effect effectively joined her Creole charms to pleasure gardens, endorsing the fact that the garden was not only a trope of paradise and fecundity, but also a place of seduction. At this pivotal moment of her biography, Josephine appeared to be a wealthy woman of noble descent and well connected to the networks of power. Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte fell passionately in love with Josephine. Her beauty, her sociability, not to mention her noble lineage, attracted the ambitious general. Josephine's natural grace and manners were consistently noted in contemporary memoirs. A drawing of Josephine by Proudhon reveals her features <coughs> were captivating and her gaze must have been entrancing. After a brief but passionate romance, they were married in the civil service on March 9, 1796. Josephine, a widow, was free to remarry, and her second marriage was built on mutual ambitions. For Bonaparte, Josephine offered access to Parisian society. Alternati alternatively, Josephine hoped that General Bonaparte would provide her with financial security. So this is a plan of Malmaison after her death on the left and an aerial view of Malmaison today. With Bonaparte's departure for Egypt, Josephine could now speculate against her husband's salary. Josephine, who had topophilic associations with Malmaison, opened negotiations to buy the property against Bonaparte's wishes and closed the deal in April 1799. She announced the purchase as a fait accompli to Bonaparte, six months after the acquisition of Malmaison and two days after the coup d'état de Brumière, which is the 18th of November, 1799, Josephine and Bonaparte went to Malmaison in their new roles as consul and, consul and consulesse. Napoleon and Josephine became what we would recognize today as a power couple. Again, her biographer, Pansmay, explains, and I quote, they desired to mark their personal success directly on the land, thus establishing their roots in the heart of a new society. Buying a beautiful property accomplished this need, because it gave them a status of lords, not of the gentry of the old regime, penniless and clutching their seigneurial prerogatives, but of a new, young, and talented masters profiting from the sale of national assets, and what that is in French is bien national, thus replacing the former landed aristocracy, end of quote. Josephine, to fulfill, fulfill her role as consort to the nation, set out to transform Malmaison into a fertile garden and ornamental farm, which could function as a symbol of domestic prosperity. Josephine hired Jean-Marie Morel, who dedicated the second edition of his Théorie du Jardin to her in 1802. And I would recommend Joseph Despanzio's work on, um, uh, on Morel. Morel clearly explained that the success of the picturesque was dependent on the ornamental farm. And again, I quote, it seems that the minister governing a large estate, the trader who drives a great commerce, the landowner who runs a large farm, 
all competing for the common good, though by different means, should be equal in the eyes of reason. The minister masters events by his foresight, the trader his fortune by speculation, the landowner cultivates, cultivates nature through his industry and work." End of quote. Josephine transformed Merrill's theory into practice. The property was approximately 60 hectares at purchase. By 1810, it included almost 100 hectares. In her death in 1814, the entire area, working farm and garden, were approximately 726 hectares. While Josephine hired five landscape architects in five years, she did commission Morel to build a cow shed and sheep farm where she became minister of her estate, joining trade in new plants to her agronomic projects. Significantly, Malmaison was the titular seat of government when Napoleon issued the first decrees that would redefine the judicial status of land ownership. In the Senate Consultus of April 1802, which was an act with the force of law, he legitimized property sales that occurred in the revolutionary period and allowed emigres to return and reclaim some of their former properties, allowing new possibilities for <coughs> land acquisition and expansion. During the consulate, more than 30,000 hectares of land were cleared for production, and more than 40,000 properties were sold between 1800 and um, 1804. This portrait of Monsieur au corps de Saint-Just, uh, depicted as a nobleman gardener surveyor, suggests how the picturesque inspired by Josephine and Napoleon became a paradigm to rejuvenate the French uh, economy and agronomy. Josephine extended upon the already picturesque design undertaken by the previous owners at Malmaison. She was particularly interested in having a navigable river path, creating an artificial lake, and planting blooming trees and shrubberies that could be seen across vast lawns. This view of around 1810 gives some idea of the massive landscaping. So this is taken from the northwest corner of the house across the southern lawn. Um, and you can see from left to right that there were innumerable serpentine paths, the navigable river, and most important clumps of what were um, exotic trees. Along the banks of the river, um, flowering shrubs were densely planted against a backdrop of weeping willows, maples, Indian chestnuts, and cypresses. A profusion of rhododendrons, mimosas, she introduced the mimosa de France. Varieties of peonies and a rare magnolia were interspersed with native species, signaling Josephine's interest in the botanical sciences. Here's another view. This is a set of engravings, 12 of them that were taken around 1810 by an artist whose name is Garneret, and they're the best that we have of um, looking at Malmaison. And you can also see her swans. I don't think you see a black swan, but she was the first to acclimate black swans from Australia to um, Malmaison. Here's another engraving looking over the bridge. Okay. Um, from the outset, Josephine commissioned a greenhouse 50 meters long that is on the left that rivaled the greenhouses at the newly founded Jardin de Plantes, which is on the right. And she built smaller conservatories in an orangery to display her collections. The dialogue with the Jardin de Plantes Plant was important, both friendly competition and rivalry. And you should all know that the new Jardin de Plantes founded in the Revolutionary was the old Jardin de Bois. So it's the same institution, but it became um, uh, nationalized. Uh, both friendly competition and rivalry, Josephine promoted and shared plants with the savants at the Musée d'Histoire Naturelle. At the same time, Napoleon instructed the Minister of the Interior and National Nurseries at Versailles and Paris at Rouel to supply Madame Bonaparte with every tree, shrub, or potted plant that her intendant deemed worthy to be planted at Malmaison. By March 1802, over 2,500 diverse plants, trees, and shrubs had been delivered to Malmaison so that a wide variety of plants could be admired in the greenhouses or along the promenade. Josephine quickly uh, deployed her plants in the service of politics. In 1800, she planted the Cedre de Maringo, which is still alive, um, to commemorate, this is how you see it today at Malmaison, to commemorate Napoleon's victory. To further promote her patronage, Josephine, <laughs> Josephine recruited Abbe Etienne de Ventenon, who published a folio edition of the Jardin de Malmaison from 1803 to 1804, which was illustrated with 120 plates by uh, Joseph Pierre Redouté. Ventenon deftly alluded to the question of Josephine's fecundity when he wrote, you believe that the taste for flowers should not be a sterile study. And then he continued, 
he linking Josephine's passions for plants and flowers to Napoleonic conquests. And again, I quote, you have gathered around you the rarest plants growing on French soil. Some indeed, which never before left the deserts of Arabia or the burning sands of Egypt have been domesticated through your care. Now regularly classified, they allow us they offer to us as we inspect them in the beautiful gardens of Malmaison, an impressive reminder of the conquests of your illustrious consort." End of quote. Under her care, Malmaison would become a laboratory for the natural sciences, a scientifically sanctioned empire of flora, where Josephine brought the fruits of Napoleon's victories to a garden that symbolically regenerated France. This allegorical engraving, which is actually at the Met, where we see Josephine crowned for her patronage with a view of her greenhouse in the background, again with the swans, um, clearly celebrated Josephine's ability to acclimate plants and animals. Most famously, Napoleon granted Josephine the right of presumption of rare species collected from the exhibition led by Captain Baudin to Australia in 1803 and 1804. From the consular period until her death, Josephine requested plants from commercial agents, ambassadors, the Navy, governors of French colonies, and she continued to receive shipments from her plant suppliers even, even during the Continental Navy, Naval blockade. Josephine's dedication to acclimatization served to strengthen the nation and justify her own status as a Creole who not only became naturalized to the metropole, but like her Corsican husband, conquered France and created an empire. Josephine's display of exotic plants, animals, and minerals at Malmaison justified the influx of colonial trade. In May of 1802, Napoleon issued a Senate consultus that reinstated the slave trade and attempted to restart colonial policies in the Americas. While we can speculate on Josephine's participation in Napoleon's military and political decision-making process concerning the slave trade, we do know that, Josephine, that Napoleon's vision for an empire in the Americas was a failure. He abandoned his plans two years later in 1804, notably with the sale of the Louisiana Purchase, following the defeat of his brother-in-law, General Leclerc, whose death and the overwhelming loss of his troops from yellow fever turned Napoleon away from the Caribbean and from the Americas. The expedition was a stunning argument against acclimatization, highlighting the difficulties for human beings to adapt to foreign climates. Yet Josephine remained dedicated to acclimatization as a leitmotif of her patronage. Um, as a maritime, therefore, as maritime colonial policy was modified after 1804, at Malmaison she continued to validate colonial, now imperial trade. Josephine's endorsement of acclimatization was not uh, only apparent in her pursuit of exotics, but also her dedication to sheep farming. And this is the sheep farm that was built by um, Morel. Early debates about acclimatization began under the direction of um, Jean-Marie Daubeton in the 1780s and focused on the delivery of merinos from Spain to France, previewed under the Ancien Regime, but because of the revolutionary decade, the sheep did not arrive until 1800. Josephine requested that Napoleon deliver 1,000 merinos to Malmaison. So the Rambouillet sheep farm still exists today, and these are the merino sheep that still live there. Um, in 1804, Josephine wrote to Napoleon that she had successfully acclimated merino sheep and that she would soon be able to have a public auction of wool. On the one hand, we can argue that Josephine was emulating Marie Antoinette's role as shepherdess from the Petit Trianon and from Rambouillet appealing to the pastoral ideal, yet I believe that Josephine had another agenda. She endorsed sheep farming as a validation of colonial enterprise. And again, I would refer you to the work of Meredith Martin, who has also written on the use of tree policy at Rambouillet from 1783 to 1787. But I want to focus a little bit more um, on the sheep. Now. Although wool was not cotton, Josephine intended to speculate on this commodity, as she had profited from the sugar trade, parlaying her knowledge for wool into a prize crop that was essential for military uniforms. Josephine had already tried to speculate on military uniforms um, when Napoleon was a general, and he forbid her from doing that. Um, she now turned her ambition to military to the military uniforms again that further supported the wool industry. Josephine de declared her ability to facilitate acclimatization and symbolically intervene in the French economy. 
she also did this through her um, support, which is probably more well known to the students, of cashmere shawls and wool shawls at this period. Um, it was not until she became empress, however, that Josephine could fully turn to Marie Antoinette's former gardens to embellish her own. Napoleon granted Josephine access to Alexandre Lenoir's museum, his Elysee, where she repurposed fountains and architectural fragments from the Ancien Regime in a new picturesque setting. This is her Neptune fountain. Perhaps it is not surprising that Josephine's most explicit pillaging focused on the queen's former dairy at Rambouillet, the symbol of maternity and fertility. So I'm really not interested in the fact that um, Marie Antoinette didn't really like Rambouillet. She only went there once. Um, this was an extraordinary commission. Um, and I really want to focus on the marble friezes. But even though um, this project, Marie Antoinette was not involved in it, it was dedicated to her. Um, this is what you see when you walk inside, which is a spectacular grotto, wonderful sculptures by Pierre, Julien, and I'm interested in the friezes, um, the marble friezes on each side. But what Josephine would have known is that it was dedicated to Marie Antoinette. Um, so that's something that she would have been, she was particularly interested um, in these friezes, which was the story of the nymph Amalthea who had saved you, had saved um, the privileged child so that um, by giving goat's milk. So this is Josephine's um, actually dairy. Now Josephine's dairy was not as elaborate as the Rambouillet dairy. Rambouillet dairy, and it is not clear where she intended to install these mass massive marble friezes. They did, however, her firm her desire to be aligned with milk, a healthy product so clearly associated with uh, motherhood. So you see her little um, goats and sheep and where she would have gone every day, which she did. She had milk delivered to her every day. Now, when Josephine was crowned empress in December 1804, her status was once again most clean, keenly aligned with the role of former queens. She was expected to provide an heir to the imperial throne. By the time David exhibited his painting of the Sacre in 1808, the issue of Josephine's fertility literally occupied the center stage of visual culture and public discourse. David transformed paint into makeup, attempting to render the now 41-year-old Josephine, who was a grandmother, younger with the potential for procreation. As Boyi's painting of visitors looking at the sacro suggests, the public and the court wondered how to just justify the empress's status. Following the terms of the marriage contract, without a legitimate heir, her position was unten untenable. By 1809, the fantasy of Josephine's potential fecundity was exposed. Repudiated, she retired to Malmaison, and that's the famous portrait of the Louvre that you see on the right by Proudhon, which of course really wasn't exhibited by the, because the time he was finished, she was um, going to be divorced. Um, and that's a 19th century um, rendering of the divorce settlement on the left. So by 1809, the fantasy of Josephine's potential fecundity was exposed. Repudiated, she retired to Malmaison. Most significantly, when Napoleon concluded the divorce agreement, he attributed Jose Josephine's sole ownership of Malmaison, which undermined his own edicts in the Napoleonic codes that precisely barred women from property ownership. Upending centuries of ancien regime common law, women were excluded from the most prized form of financial stability, property. Josephine exploited her position as a repudiated empress to justify her exceptional status by adopting one of the oldest tropes for garden patronage, retirement, to secure her status and legacy. And she declared, it makes me quite happy to see plants from abroad flourish in my garden. I hope that Malmaison soon will be a rich resource for all of the departments. I am having innumerable trees and shrubs from the summit, southern hemisphere in North America grown here. I should like every department in 10 years' time to possess a collection of valuable plants from my nurseries." End of quote. In retirement at Malmaison, Josephine's garden was now essentially in competition with Napoleon's own patronage. In 1804, Napoleon annexed the Grande Petit Trianon to the imperial domain, and Josephine was poised to become titular owner of the Queen's estate. Did Josephine imagine occupying the Petit Trianon and claiming the Queen's legacy as her own? <coughs> 
The revolutionary vandalism of the Petit Trianon and the Hameau precluded any immediate ideas of occupation. Marie Antoinette's collection of rare trees had already been sent to the museum in 1793. The garden for fabriques had been dilapidated on the grounds, especially at the Hameau, had been divided into lots and sold to various owners. Plans for restoration, as Annick Heitzman has demonstrated, focus on linking the Grand to the Petit Trino, which is the plan on the left, and did not begin in earnest until 1806-1807, when Josephine's fate was already shifting towards the divorce. After the divorce, Napoleon, draft of Malmaison, now fully focused his energies on the Petit Trinon. He invited his mother and then his sister, Caroline, to inhabit Gabriel's former pavilion. After the negotiation of his marriage to Marie Antoinette's grand niece, Marie Louise, Napoleon entered the imperial Habsburg family and looked to highlight the Austrian French alliance. Restoring the gardens of the Petit Trianon effectively endorsed Marie Antoinette's original program, but for Marie Louise, whom he cast as a devoted consort who reigned over a fertile garden of state, solidifying the Franco Austrian alliance. Most significantly, Napoleon restored one of the dairies at the Hameau and inscribed Marie, and Lu Marie Louise's initials on the marble table, literally erasing the queen's heraldry so that the dairy served as the embodiment of healthy milk flowing to Napoleon's son, the King of Rome, born in 1811. Unlike her illustrious predecessors, however, Marie Louise was not an active patron. She served as a cipher for Napoleon, who usurped female agency to declare his own fertility. Napoleon appropriated the topus of fertility for himself. By restoring the most famous picturesque garden in France, Napoleon now controlled both the monarchic, imperial public gardens, as well as modern landscape, enriched with botanical species that had been nurtured by female patrons. By appropriating the Petit Trianon, the garden as a sign of female regeneration was now under male dominion, demonstrating the validity of the Napoleonic codes, exclusion of women from property ownership. By casting himself as the fertile father, Napoleon diminished the roles that Marie Antoinette and Josephine had assumed as designers, estate managers, or stewards. Feminine capacity to intervene and transform the natural and political world was effaced. The garden was no longer a place for female agency, but ceded to public and masculine arenas. When Napoleon entered a publicity campaign, deliberately celebrating his fertility and familial dedication in prints and painting, so on the left, you're seeing him at the baptismal service, and there you're seeing him literally taking his child and showing it to the crowd. And then this is a painting from 1812 where you can imagine Napoleon having dinner with Marie Louise with his son. And then this is a lithograph from the 1820s, a hand-colored lithograph where you can again see him um, with the, um, the Roi de Rome. While Napoleon entered a publicity campaign celebrating his fertility and family ded dedication in prints and paintings, a cultural performance that deserves more in-depth research, we know his dream of good fatherhood was short-lived. By 1815, Marie-Louise fled to Vienna with their treasured heir to the Napoleonic Empire, forfeiting his title. It is worth mentioning that, in fact, it's Josephine's grandson who became Napoleon III. In conclusion, Considering Marie Antoinette and Josephine as frivolous consorts whose soft power contributed to a celebrity fashion system where the picturesque became a popular motif of self-fashioning does not do justice to their contribution to garden history. The fact that their roles as patrons, designers, horticulturists, and estate managers have been written out of the garden history canon becomes apparent when we turn to a recent publication dedicated to garden culture published in 2013. Here is an explication of Napoleon's role in garden patronage, and I quote, Napoleon not only enforced his legal codes and political system upon conquered states, but also commissioned the laying out of liberty gardens, parks, and plazas in many cities. Botanical gardens played an important role in the building of empires, both at home and in the colonies. They tamed wilderness, ordered and classified nature, and contributed to the development of a new world order <coughs> based on the imperialist and capitalist powers of the modern Western world. André and Gabriel Touin in France were explicit about their duty to contribute to the betterment of society through economic and scientific botany. They believed in scientific progress, and André Touin in particular saw his work and his fellow botanists as the foundation of a peaceful world order based on international exchange. There is no reference to Josephine. 
the Tuin brothers were firmly established at the Jardin des Plantes, whereas Michel Foucault reminds us they were dedicated to classification and women were excluded from the scientifically sanctioned norms of classification. The savants and, botan and botanists seized on this opportunity to assert the Jardin des Plantes as the professional training ground for landscape architects. Women, deprived of property ownership, were now placed at the margins of horticultural experimentation. It is with a certain irony, then, that Marie Antoinette and Josephine's roles as garden patrons for the 50 critical years that saw the transformation from ancien regime to empire were considered exceptional or even unnatural, representing fashionable disorder, when in fact their attempts to acclimate to France enriched the botanical and agronomic patrimony. Nonetheless, the gardens at Malmaison and the Petit Trianon survive, reminding us that female garden patronage was not only a question of fashion or exceptional taste, but served a generational role in the dissemination of the picturesque garden style in the 19th century. Their gardens reflected a seminal moment when women operated at the center of power and endorsed new visions of the natural, exactly when explorers, travelers, commercial plantsmen, and savants were debating a multiplicity of theories about natural history. While they certainly served as political wives, Marie Antoinette and Josephine contributed to wider discourses about acclimatization, colonial and imperial ambitions that would be debated in gardens, colonial planning, and politics throughout the 19th century. Perhaps you can join me today suggesting that it is time to reconsider the legacy of an Austrian queen and Creole empress. Thank you. She was what we call a survivor, mm -hmm. and, uh, she, yeah. uh, and uh, <laughs> she was very good at uh, from years of, of sort of self-preservation, economic. That's where she got many of her management skills. Mm -hmm. I would think. Now, where do you think Marie Antoinette's management skills came from? Because I don't think her mother taught her very much well before she was shut off to France. Uh, management skills. Well, we could say that she didn't do that very well. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way of reading her management skills. Um, mm -hmm. She was able to bring a certain amount. I think Marie Antoinette being brought up in the Austrian court and being brought up in the court system basically believed that she had a right to do whatever she wanted mm -hmm. there. And what was exceptional was that she really took a domain that she was following, mm -hmm. not so much on the footsteps of Louis XV, but more of Madame du, du Berry mm -hmm. and Madame de Pompidour, but as a queen, not as a mistress. Mm -hmm. So as a queen, she was able to set up Meek as her own director of her own kind of um, the architect de, de la Reine and used the botanist there. And it, it ended up being quite a problem because she had no accountability to the Batiment de Roi system, which, when she was on trial, became the fact that there were no economic records because she basically believed that she could do what she wanted <coughs> to do. And I think the most important work to really understand this is to go back to jo Joel Felix's 700-page, absolutely magnificent history of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, and to understand that she completely had her husband's support, and that what she was doing there was considered a completely appropriate 
in creating pleasure for her husband and the royal family. So I think within the court patronage system, <coughs> and within the heritage that she had a little bit more freedom from Marie Therese allowed her to do that. And then as we know, you know, until 1781, she was being told what to do all the time. I mean, her mm -hmm. mother was constantly saying, stop doing this, stop doing that, please do this, don't do that, why are you doing that? So, and their greatest correspondence, where they seem to have the greatest affinity, um, was actually when they're writing about gardens. Mm -hmm. Because Marie Antoinette, Marie Therese, things that she, Marie Antoinette will never see, they actually correspond about. It's one of the only times that she's not being berated by her mother. Right, <laughs> right. And, and so it's sort of a, I mean, Josephine has a parallel empire of her own. Basically, yes. mm -hmm. and did, did Marie Antoinette also feel that way in, in some to some extent? Do you think? I think she did, um, but I think what's different about Josephine is that she really brought incredible scientific minds. She really was interested scientifically, where I think that what Marie Antoinette would have been aware that there was a great colonial machine that made this possible, but she thought of it as. Uh, endorsement of luxury, which, as Queen of France, she was supposed to be doing because she was the center of the economy. Mm -hmm. I think it really has to do with how luxury generated out of Versailles was still the main uh, way to, um, the fact that she changed her fashions every other week for whatever color she mm -hmm. wanted was crucial to making the economy run. Mm -hmm. And she knew that she was doing that self-fashioning and using that as a platform. Mm -hmm. And I still think Carolyn Weaver's book is really good about, about, on it. But for those of you who've been interested in fashion. How much of Malmaison is left now? A lot. Well, not, not the 726 acres, <laughs> but, um, and certainly not the sheep. There are no sheep anymore there. Yeah. Um, but part of it has become, belongs to the city. Um, not, uh, much of the garden, much of the South Lawn is reduced. Um, and the way that the Rose Garden, I mean, one of the things that I didn't have time to do, but of course, I'm sure that you all know about, excuse me, is the Regite roses that are out at Mount Maison. And the restoration of that Rose Garden is not how she would have restored it. But we do know about her Rose Garden activities thanks to the illustrations after her death by Regite. They weren't started until 1817. I had a question. Um, it must, there must have been a lot of continuity in, in the gardeners and the people that actually did the gardening and the landscaping, and were, the, were there continuities between the, the, the queens, and are there, pe are there records of? Well, well, the interesting part in it is there are amazing continuities between Josephine and the people who are set out on expeditions. Uh -huh. Okay, so in terms of her understanding that she has to bring in new fruits and flowers and her incredible passion for that, because really, she's pretty uneducated. This is the only area that she remains educated and, 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 and seems to have really dedicated herself. The gardeners went through several generations, but then basically all focused at the Jardin de Plante. So there were some gardeners at Versailles, if they survived, they survived the revolutionary decade. They went and worked the, at the Jardin de Plantes. And then she brought in some others and her own gardeners who were really much more interested in the expeditions. But there's still kind of a monopoly goes to the Jardin de Plantes. And there is continuity, but because of the Jardin de Plantes. Other questions? Can I ask? When, when, when one thinks, thank you so much for connecting these two. Know, parts that are so often divorced because mm. of the because of the revolution. Uh, yeah, but it's, mm. yeah. I think it's, your <laughs> points are quite 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 right to see them in the continuity. You know, when one thinks of the of the Queen's Garden uh, at uh, Trianon, also in terms of what how it got represented, you know, one thinks a lot about fabrique, right? About outdoors and some which had allegorical programs, others of which were just to support entertainment and things like that. That seems to have fallen away, or tell me if, it, if, I, if I'm right in understanding that, that, that that was not the focus of Josephine's The fabrique and the interest, parties? The idea of building a kind of sequence of pavilions from which one moves. No, you know, there is a sequence. There is a sequence, but it's a much larger space. Mm -hmm. um, and the real difference is that Josephine would allow people, a much wider public and a scientific public, um, to come to her gardens. And then she would make sure that the conservatories and visiting the conservatories was part of that. So the sequence was, she had 
less, she had a temple of love. She had almost exactly the same okay, fabrics okay. that Marie Antoinette had, but they were spread out. And what she really wanted you to do was kind of paddle along on this navigable river. Especially to go to the green, to, to the sail. Right? But that's, especially that's, going to the sail and, and to the, and to the, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So and you should know, hmm. you should know that she did manage um, to grow sugar cane in um, the conservatories, <laughs> and that her grandson, okay, Hortense's second son, who survived and became Napoleon III, who bought Malmaison and restored it um, for the Universal Exhibition in 1855, his greatest memory was the summer he spent with his grandmother tasting sugar cane at Malmaison. <laughs> There's a whole other kind of 19th century history that's really fascinating with the um, martyred um, victim queen mm. and then the fetishes about her and then the whole Bonaparte's actually going back to Malmaison because that's where, that was their only place. You know, so there's a whole 19th century history that could also be written. It's a great dissertation topic. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So the fact that Josephine was from Martinique, I imagine that her skin color was not that pure white that we associated. But she had a lot of makeup. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. She's not. <laughs> It's interesting in, in ni early 19th century literature how much um, they talk about the sugar plantations. For instance, in, um, in Mansfield Park, which is yes. written just about that time, That's right. the Bertrams have a, 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 get their wealth from the sugar plantations. So a person who's written a lot about that is Jill um, Cassid. Um, and she writes a book that's called The Imperial Picturesque. Um, and there are many, many scholars of Jane Austen who have talked about this. Um, money that the father that leaves, um, and because he has to take care of the sugar with right. relations, and all these things happen. Um, but there is this relationship. Mm -hmm. So, in your studies, did you get any sense of how big the cast of thousands was to actually realize some of these gardens and earth moving? And, and uh, the earth moving at the Petit Trianon wasn't. It took two years. Okay, so the idea that she's out there playing from 1775 onward is she's really not because the terracing is going on for a very long time and there's all these problems where Don Chavier, the head of the King's Building Administration, is saying, I'm not paying for that. And then, you know, it takes her two years and a letter to, to Louis XVI where Don Chavier finally says, okay, you can do what you want, I don't care, just do it. And so there's almost three years and then she has all of the resources of the Bâtiment de Watts. You can get thousands to be moving out there. But wow. it did take more time. For Josephine, she had an intendant, one of, one of them after um, 1806, I think, is Amy Bonpron, who had been with Humboldt in South America. Okay, and that's the job that he gets when he gets back, because he works for Josephine. Mm -hmm. So she had intendant who were taking care of things, that she had her own gardener who had gone on the exhibition expedition to try to find the Perus. Um, and then, so she was able to also commandeer quite a number of gardeners, but she had quite uh, a learned... Um, you had a big Rolodex? <laughs> <laughs> and if she didn't, she made sure that she did. <laughs> All right, well, I think we can end the formal part of our talk and thank Susan once thank again. You.